I had mentioned the Medjish yesterday, not in this class, Medjish Tan Chuma. <clears throat> it's a famous Medjish, it explains what an allegory. We find that the Torah itself, only in two instances, does it tell us about the degree of reward for mitzvahs. The mitzvah Shluch HaKan, sending away a mother bird before you take the chicks or the eggs. The Torah speaks about Arichas Yomim, the length of days, and also honorings, honoring one's parent. Kibra Ve'im, the Torah speaks about Arichas Yomim. You merit longevity. Why does the Torah, in regard to these two positive commandments, does the Torah mention reward? To give us an inkling to what degree we don't understand the value of a mitzvah. Sending away the mother bird and taking the chicks and the eggs, the Torah says, Arich Yamin. There's no cost factor. It's basically effortless. And yet the Torah says, you merit Arich Yamin. You merit longevity. And honoring the parent, it's just, which is one of the most difficult mitzvahs, this cost, there's putting yourself out, a tremendous amount of imposition, Torah says, Arich Yomim. So here you have a mitzvah which is not costly, almost effortless, Torah says, Arich Yomim. And the other mitzvah which is difficult and costly, Torah says they use the same words. So evidently, it's clear we, we don't have the ability to make a, an accurate evaluation of the innate value of a mitzvah. That's the midrash. But then the midrash goes on to say, why didn't Hashem reveal to us the value of mitzvahs? So it explains with an allegory that there was a king. He wanted an orchard to be planted on his behalf. And he wanted a garden to be planted. That the orchard should contain every type of fruit tree. The garden should have every type of vegetable and herb. And the garden should have also flowers. All types of shrubs and bushes. And he announces to the various horticulturists or orchard keepers, whatever it may be, that he wants an orchard plant, and he gives a list of the different species of fruit trees and the garden in terms of herbs and vegetables and flowers. But he doesn't tell them what he's going to pay him per species. And they go to work immediately, and each one, based on what he thinks, would satisfy the king. He plants his kind of tree. At the end of the day, every tree that the king wanted in his orchard, every species and every flower and every herb was in the garden. But if the king would have revealed in advance the value of the service, the fee each one would receive, whatever would be the greatest fee, everybody would plant that particular species. And all the other species of the orchard or the garden would not be there. So therefore he conceals the fee at the end of the day, he rewards each one appropriately. So the Midrash says, in this world, God does not reward us for mitzvahs. Why? Because if a person would do a mitzvah and he'd be rewarded, so everybody would be doing mitzvahs because it's obvious. You do the mitzvah, you get this level of what of reward. So what does Hashem do? He reserves reward for the world to come. Although we speak the certain mitzvahs, we have the use of fruit in this world, but the principle for the mitzvah is not given in this world. What's given in this world, God gives us things to facilitate, to make mitzvahs easier. But it's not the reward for the mitzvah, because it would be for the reward for the mitzvah. What would be the incentive to do the mitzvah? The reward. But Hashem wants to make, give, make us beneficiaries at the ultimate level, that we should do it based on our trust and faith in him, that he will give us our due reward whenever we may be. And we do what we're supposed to do because that's his dictate, that's what we do it. That's the Midrash. 
Because if a person would see the value of a mitzvah, because he becomes a beneficiary in the material, in this world, people will do only certain mitzvahs, not other mitzvahs. But God says, every mitzvah is a necessity. Every mitzvah has to be done. Therefore, we don't see the response or the ramification, the material in this world. That's the midrash. Now, there's a basic question which is asked. If we say, Talmud Torah, can I get Kulam? And the way the Vilna Gon explains it, that even if you study one word of Torah, it's the equivalent of all the mitzvahs combined. All you tired mitzvahs, that's the innate value of Talmud Torah. So if that's the case, a person should study Torah continuously. Not put on tefillin. Not do any other mitzvah. Because every other mitzvah is, is, is considered a fraction or a pittance compared to what Torah is. But yet the halach is, the law is, regarding Talmud Torah, that if the mitzvah cannot be delegated through a third party, as we have many mitzvahs, you can only fulfill them if you do them yourself. It's called mitzvah shibu pufo. Tefillin, you can't delegate. Matzah, you can't delegate. Kriya shema, you can't delegate. You can't do it through an agent. You have to do it yourself. So any mitzvah you can't delegate, you must do yourself. That is a basis to interrupt the Torah study. But if Talmud Torah can include them, that the ultimate spiritual value is the study of Torah, it seems to be uh, contradictory to the, to the concept of the value of to advance our spirituality. So how do we understand it? Now, we had said that in the name of Chaim Vital in the past, which Chaim cites many times, that as we have Ramach Mitzvah Saseh, we have 248 positive commandments, and we have Ramach 248 parts to the body, identically the 248 components to a Jew's Neshama. Each positive commandment corresponds to one component of the Neshama. And when you do that mitzvah, that mitzvah generates an energy which infuses that component, which allows it to advance and to develop. So it's true. Talmud, the heart, the brain, is, is the most important part of a person's physicality. But yet there are other organs. they are the lungs. There are other parts to the body which are essential to the total function of everything. And everything complements everything else. So the, as a result of that, every mitzvah is a necessity because when it plays into the totality, although it's not the equivalent of Talmud Torah, but nevertheless, you can't live with, with two organs, with three organs. As a result of that, everything has to be addressed in its proper time because that particular part of the Shama needs that infusion in terms of to be advanced and developed in, in the totality of the neshama. That's the reason why, regardless of the innate value of a mitzvah, the times that you have to do the mitzvah and you can't forego it for something of greater value because of the necessity of the totality of the neshama for that reason. It's like the orchard. You can't have an orchard just with, 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 with grapes because you have to have every representation of the fruit to, to have a complete orchard. The neshama only functions if you have every type of mitzvah which addresses that part of the what of the of the neshama to be able to advance it, it needs that level of infusion for that reason. The Ra'al asked Rabbi Mendoza if he would. The Mishnah tells us if you study term toch at ultimately in the study mitoch osher. Why was Rav Chinin Mendoza? There was nobody who studied Torah and fulfilled his mitzvahs in a more limited financial setting than Rav Chinin Mendoza. And not only that, the whole world is sustained. So that tells you exactly the quality of his service. So why did he merit wealth? So Moral says he didn't want it. But if he would have wanted it, God would have given it to him. That's the Moral's answer. Okay? Now, Wealth is not so simple. Wealth presents challenges. It may make life easier, but simultaneously, when you have that extra, that little bit of extra, the question is, what do you do with that extra? 
do you invest it in where it should be invested or you use it for other things? And it causes distractions. As they say, he preferred it to be mean and lean. I don't want those challenges. That's number one. The Mars is in Brokos that a person who's a special tzaddik and he suffers and God puts him in a vice. Why? Because it's called Yisur Shalava. That that Hashem is withholding certain comforts or create certain limitations, which makes life more difficult and challenges more difficult because he wants to give greater reward to the tzaddik. Why? Because there's a principle of the Fum Tzara Agra that when there's a challenge and it's difficult and despite that you meet the challenge, the end result is greater. Because despite the, the challenge, so the tzaddik, he reaches a certain level where everything is basically almost a shuwa. He does it naturally. He has no challenges. Hashem gives him challenges. He'll have failing health. He'll have certain other issues. But only when is it Yisur Shalava? When it's given due to love, Hashem's love for that person. If there's no bitl Torah and there's no bitl Tefillah. If it doesn't infringe on your Torah study and doesn't infringe on your Tefillah, on your davening, meaning your Kavano. Doesn't, doesn't in any way distract you. If you're a Tzaddik and all that's in place, it's clear it's Yisur Shalava. Hashem is giving that Tzaddik all these difficulties only to increase his reward. To create a setting where the challenges are greater, so the end result is going to be a greater end result. For the with the concept of Tsara Agra, based on difficulty, that will increase the level of reward because despite the difficult challenge, the tzaddik meets those challenges. So Rabchinin Badosa, not only did he want the cha- the challenge of, of the wealth, he preferred to stick to hoe the road that he was owing, to have nothing, and he succeeded. And despite that, despite that difficulty, he succeeded. So how much more does that have value rather than taking the wealth, making life easier, then the challenge is a different challenge. It becomes a different challenge. This is a challenge in Lefum Tsar Agra. That's the one he wanted to stick with. And as a result of that, that's why the whole world was sustained in his merit for that reason. How do you compare that, that uh, nugget of um, that nugget to uh, Adam Arishon's desire to want to face choice to increase the merit. Okay. I had mentioned in the name of the Arizal, what was Adam's justification to eat of the tree of knowledge? God says, don't eat. And he understood he said, don't eat. And yet, despite that, he did. He chose to eat. But he only chose, and what's his name? This is the question which is posed by the Arizal. So the Arizal says, of course, before he ingested that evil and it became part of his, his being, his level of clarity was almost, almost absolute. Not quite absolute, but pretty close to it. So the disturbance between the right and wrong was a simple decision. But if this decision is so simple because truth is so obvious, there's no challenge. He wanted to ingest that fruit to create a greater level of ambiguity, to create greater amounts of gray, that despite the gray, he will make the right decision based on the principle of Fum Tsaragra. That's the morale of Prague. Excuse me, Arizal. So I asked the question. It's so obvious. I mean, God says, don't. I want to do it better. It doesn't make any sense. Why, why should Adam want to do that? So what I had said was, after Chava ate of the tree of now, the knowledge, why did Chava eat? Because Adam had misled her. But he misled her int- intentionally. Adam was concerned that if his wife is only, only knows that you're not permitted to eat, in terms of the nature of a woman, you have to, because she, to a degree, she has a certain attraction to certain things, you have to create fences. So he created a fence, 
but he didn't share with her that it was a fence. He said, not only did God say not to eat of the tree of the knowledge, he said, you should not touch the tree. So what happened as a result of this? The snake who wanted her to fail, he pushes her into the tree. And she believed that God had said, if you touch the tree, you will also die. Not only if you eat the fruit, you're going to die. So the snake says, you see, the whole thing is a bunch of nonsense. Just as you don't die when you touch the tree, you won't die even if you eat the fruit of the tree. But she had, she was misled by Odom by presenting offense as God's word, but it was not. So who was responsible for Chava's death? That she's going to become a limited being. That's Odom. So if you look at Rashi over there, Rashi cites the Chazal. It says Chava had fed the fruit, had offered the fruit to her husband. And she said to Odom, you know something? If I die, you know what's going to happen? God's going to create another wife for you. Do you think I'm going to let that, that happen? If I'm dying, you're going to die. We're in the same boat. If I demand you eat of the tree, of that fruit. That's, that's the Midrash Rashi cites. Therefore, Chava fed the fruit to Odom for that reason. Because she's not going to tolerate I'm going to check out, and God is going to provide another wife. And Odom agreed to eat. So the question I asked was, you make a mistake. And the mistake is the cause of the person's spouse's death. It's a mistake. And originally, the intention was a good intention. Now your spouse says, well, you know, now, now that I'm dying, I want you to die. It doesn't make any sense. I made a mistake, so therefore what? I, sh I should fall for my life and go against the word of God. The answer is Adam had a very serious conflict there. He had a guilt conscience over here. So how do you take this wrong and turn it into a right? That he should be able to ingest that fruit and to meet her demand. You know something? There's a concept from Saragra. It's true God says not to, but if I eat it now, there's a certain positive result. Because despite the gray, which is going to be created due to this, I will still make the right decision. But if Adam, if this whole scenario would have never happened, there would have never been a, a conflict of interest why he should even look for this rationale to justify doing the wrong thing. That's how he explained it. The way I explained it. I understood it. So again, we don't do anything. A Jew is not, we just, you're not permitted to put yourself in a position where you're testing yourself. I always say, a test which God presents is, is only a test if you're able to withstand that test. Otherwise, it's not a test. What about if you go and put yourself out on a limb and you create that level of temptation? God didn't push you there. You put yourself there. It's not so simple. You could, you could inch yourself back, back to the location of to be secure. You may fall off that limb. A test is a test when God presents a test. If you, a self-induced test by creating a setting where to test yourself, you may not be able to succeed. And that's why you're not permitted to put yourself in a position to be tested for that reason. Adam created something he wasn't permitted to create. I will create a test, and despite that, I'll meet that challenge. All humanity till today has suffered because of that decision. Now, he took down himself and he took down all humanity. The world would have reached a level of perfection if Adam would have rash, rationalized and justified the decision to eat of that tree of knowledge. But because of that rationale, he did. We're still contending with the evil of that fruit and still dealing with the Yitzhara, with the evil inclination for that reason. 